Distinguished guests, colleagues, and students. My name is Uta Poiga, and I'm the Dean of the College of Social Sciences and Humanities here at Northeastern. And it's my great pleasure to welcome all of you to this evening's Morton E. Ruderman Memorial Lecture. This evening is named after Morton Ruderman, who graduated from Northeastern University with a degree in engineering in 1959, and who became a champion of Jewish studies here at the university. It's my special honor this evening to welcome mem members of Morton Ruderman's family, and especially Morton's children, Sharon Shapiro and Jay Ruderman. It's great to see you. It's great to see you and your children here as well in the celebration of your father and grandfather. Welcome. We are so glad to have you here with us at Northeastern, and we are so grateful for the work that the Ruderman Foundation does with the university. So many thanks for being here. Let me then say a few more words about the mission of the Memorial Lecture. With the Morton E. Ruderman Memorial Lecture, the Ruderman Family Foundation allows the Northeastern Jewish Studies Program and the Northeastern Humanities Center to provide the university and Boston communities with truly unique experiences. The lecture gives us the opportunity to engage with prominent intellectuals, with scientists, artists, writers, who teach us about Jewish history and culture, and who at the same time raise questions of universal significance. Questions, for example, about religious and cultural diversity, about technology and ethics, about trauma and disability. Questions like the ones we will be tackling tonight on what Jewish history may teach us about a usable past. We are grateful to the Ruderman family and the Ruderman Family Foundation for making complex engagements with Jewish culture and history. Also, tonight's engagement with the question of a usable past possible for students and a broader public here at Northeastern. Let me turn the microphone over to my colleague, Lori Lefkowitz, who has multiple roles here at Northeastern, roles that grow from a core commitment to the interdisciplinary field of Jewish studies, and indeed from leadership in that field as well. Lori Lefkowitz is professor of English and the Ruderman professor of Jewish studies, as well as director of the Jewish studies program here at Northeastern. And last but not least, she is also the director of the Northeastern Humanities Center, which is based in my college, the College of Social Sciences and Humanities. Under Laurie's leadership, the Jewish Studies program provides students with frameworks for thinking about important issues of our day, from questions of history and ethnic conflict to questions of spirituality and the meaning of life. The Jewish Studies program inspires students to do independent projects that contribute to enriching life on campus and beyond. And Laurie also plays a leadership role in the nation's Jewish Studies Association in advising Jewish studies programs around the country and in supporting links between Northeastern and important institutions in Israel. Laurie, Professor Lefkowitz will introduce this year's Rupert Thurman Lecturer. Please join me in welcoming her to the stage, and thank you. <laughs> So thank you, Uta. Um, thank you all for being here. Uh, the Jewish Studies program at Northeastern University resides in the College of Social Sciences and Humanities. And under Dean Poiger's leadership, the college has advanced a path-breaking program in the experiential liberal arts. It is a point of pride for me that the Jewish Studies program exemplifies what I take to be critical features of Northeastern's distinctive educational model with emphases on interdisciplinarity, global engagement, co-curricular programs, experiential learning, and public humanities. Our courses, often cross-cultural and, compa and comparative, explore the history, cultures, and religion of the Jewish people, a peripatetic global people who carry a textual tradition on their backs um, which has been trans transmitted devotedly across time and place while accruing a miscellany of folkways which are also the subjects of our study. Northeastern University's Dialogue of Civilization programs in history, literature, and political science 
takes students to Israel, Palestine, Germany, Poland, and other European locations as part of the Jewish Studies program. And we send students abroad on international co-ops and internships. With the Ruderman Lecture as an annual program highlight, we offer a rich array of events that connect Jewish life and learning on campus and reach out to the greater community. Our, ex our students experience Jewish practice and history by venturing out into a wider world. And similarly, Jewish studies faculty here are especially active as educators with a local and international reach. Um, I don't see him here tonight, but I expect he might be coming. I'm thinking in particular of retiring Professor Josh Jacobson, who has been um, for 45 years here a professor of music um, and has brought Jewish music to our students and heads up the Zamir Chorale and is really an internet teaches cantorial, cantillation to cantorial students. Um, we really, our faculty are out in the world and Josh is exemplary among them and I'm just feeling that uh, I wanna use this occasion to mention him in particular, thank him and, um, and, uh, and express my pain at his retirement. Um, so we, uh, I, mentioning that and I also wanna extend my gratitude of course to our executive committee, to our students and staff, and most especially to our new administrative specialist, Deborah uh, Levison Stanhill, and as ever, to our Humanity Center administrator, Ignacio Shaparo, who patiently and reliably ensures the programmatic excellence of all of the events at the college. So, I, my thank yous. At the end of the week that we are in, um, some of us are shuddering with anticipation, uh, Jews worldwide will engage in one of the most ancient continuous ritual enactments on record, the Passover Seder, a Jewish version of the Greek symposium at which families and friends drink wine and deliberate on the meaning of freedom while eating and studying texts. This ordered meal is understood to be a living in the present of the mythic transition between slavery and freedom, reminding us that the Exodus, a paradigm for all liberation movements in all times, was not a one-time occurrence, but must be renewed vigilantly, thoughtfully, energetically, and continuously. The march across the desert towards redemption must be sustained a living metaphor for the struggle for freedom, which is always fragile. Most of all, the Seder is about intergenerational education. In Judaism, history is understood as the generations. And as I participate in the, participated in this, weekend's, um, this weekend in Boston's March for Our Lives, led by school children, I saw signs of never again words that echoed a refrain from my own childhood when we commemorated the Holocaust and marched for Soviet Jewry, and in my experience, swelled the city streets of New York. Before I formally introduce this year's Ruderman lecturer, Professor David N. Myers, who is both an extraordinarily accomplished academic and leading public intellectual, and therefore a perfect choice for this Ruderman lecture, I want to mark our annual ritual moment when we honor the memory of the patriarch of the Ruderman family and the patron of the Northeastern University Jewish Studies Program, Morton Ruderman. Morton Ruderman lived a life of success and gratitude, deeply appreciative of the contribution of his North Northeastern education to his own achievements. He and Marsha Ruderman sustained the Jewish Studies Program with foundational gifts, including the establishment of the chaired professorship that I so gratefully and humbly hold. Um, because Morton Ruderman believed, as he said, in preserving Jewish religion, culture, and identity through education. His legacy lives in his children and grandchildren, his Jewish generations. Uh, Jewish studies at Northeastern is daily grateful to the philanthropy of Morton Ruderman and the Ruderman Family Foundation and consciously works to honor his intentions. <laughs> 
The Seder, which I just mentioned, celebrates an exodus that was led by a reluctant prophet, the greatest of the prophets, Moses, and his siblings, Miriam and Aaron, a mutually supportive troika. When called upon to challenge the tyranny of the Pharaoh, Moses humbly protested that his speech impediment makes him an unlikely leader, to which God replied that Moses is God's choice, but that his brother Aaron can speak on his behalf, teaching the lesson that each of us has unique abilities and responsibilities, and all of us must use our strengths to enable one another to make their best contributions. This is the value that motivates the Ruderman Family Foundation, whose mission statement reads, and I'm quoting, quote, guided by our Jewish values, we advocate for and advance the inclusion of people with disabilities throughout our society, foster a more nuanced understanding of the American Jewish community among Israeli leaders, and model the practice of strategic philanthropy worldwide. The mission, like the exodus commemorated at the Seder, is a redemptive one. In another metaphor, Jewish folklore imagines that the bridge to paradise and the bridge on which the Messiah will walk is made of paper. We like bridges. In another Hasidic metaphor, the world is likened to a narrow bridge and humanity is enjoined not to be afraid. In the, in the making of scholars, um, or in the work of scholars, um, they create the paper on which our bridges are built in the form of books. Um, our speaker tonight, David N. Myers, himself crosses bridges between the public and the academy, between here and now, and varieties of there and then. David Myers brings history to life, both by making the past vivid and by demonstrating, through his journalism and public presentations, the urgency of history's relevance. David Myers is the founding president and CEO of the Center for Jewish History in New York, as well as the Sadie and Ludwig Kahn Professor of Jewish History at UCLA. With a BA from Yale, Myers began his graduate studies in modern Jewish history at Tel Aviv University, continued on to Harvard University, where he spent a year studying medieval Jewish thought. He completed his doctorate with distinction at Columbia, and there wrote the basis, what would become the basis for his first book, Reinvest Reinventing the Jewish Past, European Jewish Intellectuals, and the Zionist Return to History. On the faculty at UCLA since 1991, Myers served as director of the UCLA Center for Jewish Studies on and off for 10 years, and also served as the Robert N. Burr uh, department chair of the UCLA History Department from 2010 to 2015. Meyer's scholarly work touches on key themes in modern Jewish history, including the history of Jewish historiography, the history of Zionism, and modern Jewish intellectual history. His books include Resisting History, Historicism and Its Discontents in German Jewish Thought, Between Jew and Arab, The, Last Vo the Lost Voice of Simon Ravidovich, Simply and simply Jewish History, which is a small book in the um, Oxford University Press series of very short introductions, and most recently, The Stakes of History, The Use and Abuse of Jewish History for Life. Myers has participated in editing eight volumes, including The Jewish Past Revisited, Enlightenment and Diaspora, The Armenian and Jewish Cases, and The Faith of, Fall the Faith of Fallen Jews, Yosef Chaim and the Writing of Jewish History. In addition to two forthcoming edited volumes, uh, Myers is also completing a book with law professor Nomi uh, Stolzenberg, with whom he incidentally also parents three daughters on the Satmar Hasidic community of Kiryas Yoel um, in New York. Myers has taught in France and Russia, visited twice at the Institute for Advanced Studies in Jerusalem, has, has been a fellow twice at the Center for Advanced Judaic Studies in Philadelphia, a longtime instructor for the Wexner Heritage Foundation. David Myers is an elected fellow of the Academy, American Academy 
for Jewish research. Um, since 2003, he served as editor or co-editor of the premier journal of Jewish studies, the Jewish Quarterly Review. This evening, David Myers will make an impassioned plea for studying the past, speaking with us about why Jewish history is so important today. I give you David and Myers. Good evening, everyone. Thank you very much for making time out of your busy schedules to uh, join tonight in this uh, celebratory occasion. I'd like to begin by thanking Dean Poiger uh, for her words uh, and Lori Lefkowitz for um, her excessive introduction, um, uh, of me at least. Um, but I'm deeply touched and privileged uh, to be here under the aegis of the Ruderman Lecture, the Morton Ruderman Lecture. Um, I did a little bit of reading um, on uh, Morton Ruderman and uh, discovered what uh, many of you know, which is that he was uh, a person of, uh, of action, um, a person who uh, appreciated uh, the vibrancy of culture um, and the importance of philanthropy. Um, and I was so deeply touched uh, when I expanded my own knowledge about the Ruderman Foundation. I, have known for a, a number of years about uh, various initiatives in the field of Jewish studies, uh, especially with close colleagues at the University of Haifa. What I didn't know was the depth of the commitment to disability rights, which is such an important issue in our time, which is a key civil rights issue in our time, a human rights issue, um, and really uh, enriched uh, my understanding of uh, the important work that you do, and I can only imagine how your father and grandfather is looking down with great pride on uh, the work you do. So thank you very much. Um, I want to make just one more uh, brief prefatory remark, and that is that my mother-in-law is in this audience, uh, Judith Levine, with whom I'll be celebrating in a few short days. And so I want to thank her for coming as well, all the way from Cambridge, Massachusetts. <laughs> um, Lori mentioned that I was chair of the UCLA History Department for five years, and I remember very palpably the nervousness and anxiety of parents uh, over what their children would do with a history degree. What's the use of history? What, what door does that open? Please tell me, they would say. And this is immediately after uh, the economic crash of 2008-09 when anxiety about the future of young college graduates was uh, quite intense. Um, and in thinking about that question, uh, and the utility of history, which will be the subject of my remarks, we should remind ourselves of the era we inhabit, which is so saturated with uh, the rapidity of news cycles, one uh, blaring headline replacing another after uh, uh, a few brief seconds, uh, living in that world of uh, the constant agitation of uh, social media and the popular press, uh, there doesn't seem to be much space for history, for the depth of perspective that history offers. And yet I would say it's precisely because of that short-sightedness embedded in our uh, incessant use of, of social media that we need to uh, call back to that long-term perspective. Um, as we look out in the world today, um, whether we're uh, looking at uh, Turkey or making our way to the United States, we see turmoil and upset, and strange phenomena. And it seems to me that this is a period, maybe even the period of history, uh, the period, or certainly a period, when we demand to know how exactly did we get where we are today. Please help us understand uh, the path by which we have made ourselves to the current state uh, of turmoil. Uh, unfamiliar as it is. And in fact, it's not surprising that a number of historians have seen fit to really connect the past to the present, to make a link between uh, the recent or distant past and the current state of turmoil and upheaval. Um, two important books that uh, make this applied historical uh, move uh, are Timothy Snyder's well-known uh, book on tyranny, which is uh, based on uh, a brief article that he wrote in which he enumerated 20 lessons from the past. And then more recently, uh, Stephen Levitsky and Daniel Zeiblatt uh, 
um, from Harvard University have uh, taken up a question that, in fact, the political scientist Juan Linz uh, posed before us, uh, which is how do we know when uh, the foundations of democracy in a society are uh, subject to a strain that they cannot bear? Um, history, I would say, provides not just a measure, an antidote to the instant gratification of social media, which at some level may be actually physically uh, burrow, forge neural pathways in our brain, that kind of addiction to, uh, to uh, one's uh, device. Um, but it offers the depth of perspective that allows us to understand the unfolding of events um, and, and helps us explain how we got where we are. So I'm delighted to see that these uh, three scholars have, in fact, uh, very deliberately taken up the task of connecting past to present. Um, so uh, what I'm going to do today um, is to try and uh, expand on uh, the link between past and present and do so with a sense of urgency because of uh, the predicament that we find ourselves in really throughout the world, uh, facing a new set of social and political relationships uh, that seem to us uh, deeply upsetting and at some level unfamiliar. Um, I will switch back and forth between history writ large and Jewish history, so please do not get alarmed uh, because I think uh, what occurs in the field of Jewish history is in fact a reflection of what we see more generally in the field of uh, history at large. Um, but let me begin at the beginning and ask, what is history? Um, what do we mean when we say history? And this is of course a, a question that was raised um, quite explicitly by the ancient Greeks who uh, understood history as res geste, uh, uh, the, the things of the past, um, as well as the account of the things of the past, the, the events of the past. Um, when we say the word history, we often uh, mean those two things, and that double meaning is present in uh, many different languages um, when we talk about history. Historians and philosophers have pondered the relationship between those two things, the events themselves and the interpretation of the events, um, uh, and, and asked, what's the correlation? Is there a direct correspondence between the event and the way it is represented? And of course, it is not uh, exact. There's no exact correspondence. Everybody uh, brings a set of lenses uh, grinded uh, by the, uh, the, the, the spirit of the time uh, to uh, his or her reading of the past. One of the most important uh, figures to meditate upon the relationship between the events of the, of the past and the way that they have been recorded um, is uh, this person, actually was this person, Hayden White, who just uh, passed away uh, a few weeks ago. Um, and I uh, bring him to this presentation because he had such a powerful effect on our understanding of the nature of the relationship between the past and its interpretation. One of the leading uh, historians and philosophers of history of our time, uh, whose 1973 work, Meta History, really elevated our understanding about the way in which historians framed, or to use his famous term, and plotted the past. Um, White didn't deny that there were events that took place in the past, um, as some of his critics said. What he did do was understand with a degree of sophistication that few before him had possessed, um, the way in which uh, historians come to uh, that framing process. Um, and so I wanted to um, uh, offer a, a, a brief homage to Hayden White for his important contributions. Um, that said, his insights were not altogether new. Um, if we go back to the mid 20th century and think of the great uh, English philosopher and historian, R.G. Collingwood, um, we are reminded of his um, key term to help us understand what the historian actually does to link the past to, uh, to his or her understanding, and that is uh, reenactment. Uh, the, the operative term for R.G. Collingwood, one of the leading philosophers of history of the 20th century, uh, was reenactment. The historian sets about to reenact the past, to recreate the thought process of figures using all of the tools available to him or her. Um, and in uh, Collingwood's time, that very often meant uh, the full body of published and unpublished sources that reflect uh, the thought process of a 
particular uh, person. His own interest and orientation was very much towards intellectual history. Um, he was very much um, committed and concerned, committed to and concerned about reconstructing the thought process of the past. Uh, but his notion of reenactment, I think, is a very important one because it reminds us of that uh, intrusion or involvement of the historian in the framing of the past. The historian who is a product of her environment, of her emotions, of her dispositions, um, in ways that complicate the linkage between uh, the events themselves and the way they're interpreted. I want to add um, an important term to uh, those framing conditions that I mentioned, environment, uh, sentiments, dispositions, emotions, and that is identity, identity, um, which has something of a uh, negative connotation in contemporary political discourse, uh, an idea to which I will return, uh, but which in my rendering, in my understanding, seems to be simply unavoidable um, in in trying to make sense of the way in which historians themselves process the past, which is to say every historian brings an element of her or his identity to uh, the work of uh, writing the past. Um, I here hold by um, uh, a figure whom I regard as one of the great underappreciated Jewish thinkers of the 20th century about whom uh, I wrote a book that Laurie mentioned, uh, a great um, uh, scholar and one of the founding members of the Jewish Studies faculty at Brandeis University, a man by the name of Simon or Shimon Ravidovich, um, who uh, in an essay uh, called for um, a fifth freedom to be added to uh, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt's four freedoms, uh, which he gave voice to in his State of the Union address in January 1941. Ravidovich mentioned uh, the, uh, a fifth freedom, the right to be different. Um, libertas differendi, by which he meant that there, are, there is great virtue in a plurality and a pluralism of cultural traditions that together can make for the rich fabric of the human condition. Um, and this, I think, fuels my own sense of uh, uh, not only the inescapability, but even the potential benefit of what I call an identitarian investment by the historian, a very profoundly inelegant term, I confess to you. Uh, but nonetheless, which conveys this idea that identity is not only an important part of what makes for the historical interpretation, it can be a benefit by opening up new pathways of understanding. Um, it can be a positive force. And I think of that not only in the context of Jewish history, I think of that in the context of other important historical traditions of the 20th century. Um, and here, uh, I'd like to call our attention to two in particular. Um, the first is um, uh, the field of African-American studies, which was so profoundly enriched by uh, the great African-American historian John Hope Franklin, uh, for whom history uh, was an extremely important uh, tool to uh, unearth and excavate a history that had been suppressed or pushed to the margins. And Franklin went about his work not merely to uh, enrich and illuminate the historical canvas, but because it was a very important part of who he was as a human being. It was a very important part of who he was as an African American. Um, and in a similar uh, vein, I'd like to remind us of the pioneering work of one of the great uh, women's historians uh, of this country, um, the Viennese-born uh, Gerda Lerner, who um, wrote um, uh, a number of important works, including a book called Why History Matters, to remind us of the importance of historical investigation. She also wrote about her own Jewish origins and how uh, her own sense of Jewishness as it evolved over the course of her life really contributed to her uh, sense of commitment to excavating stories that were hidden or marginalized. That's really what stood at the heart of her work in women's history, uh, to bring to uh, full view, to bring to a level of visibility that which had been suppressed or forgotten, the history of women. And she did so uh, in no, no small part as a woman for whom uh, we can see a very powerful identitarian uh, investment. 
Um, that investment, again, can help excavate. It can help overcome bias, uh, distortion, uh, or denial. Um, and um, I would suggest to you that this um, quality of the historian, the identitarian investment, the investment of one's identity in the work of uh, uncovering the past has been a very important force in Jewish history. And I want to turn our attention now to uh, the play of identity in the work of Jewish history and really explore some of the functions to which uh, Jewish historians put Jewish history. Um, I want to focus on three in particular, um, and they are three of the anchoring principles in one of the two books out there, which you're invited at least to take a look at. Um, that's a book the called The Stakes of History. Um, when I went about writing this book, which was really an extended conversation with my great teacher about whom I'll talk in a little bit, Professor Yosef Chaim Yerushalmi. Um, I thought of three um, guiding principles uh, around which the enterprise of modern Jewish historical scholarship uh, ha ha has revolved. Um, there are surely other guiding motifs, but these are three that really struck me and that really manifested and made clear the identitarian investment of Jewish historians in the past. Uh, the first is liberation, the second is consolation, and the third is witnessing. Uh, so let me talk uh, briefly about each of them. So when we think of liberation, um, I, my mind extends back to the founding father, we might say, of modern Jewish studies, uh, a figure by the name of Le Leopold Suntz, who in 1818, 200 years ago today, and we will be having a conference at the Center for Jewish History, one programmatic plug, in October to mark the 200th anniversary of that essay. Um, in a kind of foundational programmatic essay from 1818, Tsuntz really laid out the agenda for Jewish studies uh, without any benefit of predecessors to help guide him. He really, as a 23-year-old, as a had this quite remarkable prophetic vision um, of the uh, evolution and the desiderata, the important areas that uh, the Jewish studies in its modern guise had to assume. He was wrong about one thing uh, in his essay. He was right about a whole lot, but he was wrong about one thing. Um, and it's interesting to think back to his time to understand why he might think this. He said, one thing we know for sure is that there will be many fewer Hebrew books in 1918 than there were in 1818. Right? He couldn't have anticipated the rise of the Zionist movement or of modern Hebrew literature and language. Um, but he got a lot right. Um, and what Tsuntz really tried to do was to um, utilize the new critical tools of the historian that he acquired in university to liberate Jewish texts from those who he felt had distorted or twisted or marginalized uh, important themes embedded in those texts. And he had in mind, as those from whom he wanted to wrest control, traditional Jewish scholars who lacked the sufficient critical capacity to read those texts and understand them in context, and Christian scholars who he thought did not have a sufficiently large empathy for the past actors that he thought was an essential process of uh, his own work of historical interpretation. So he really felt himself embarked on a project of liberation of the sources of the Jewish past from uh, both Jewish and Christian scholars, traditional cr Jewish scholars and modern critical Christian scholars who we thought were too devoted to uh, the critical enterprise and to understanding uh, Jewish texts as, uh, as the preface to uh, the evolution of Christianity. Um, and I would suggest that this impulse towards liberating, uh, while at the same time paired with a deep commitment to the careful, meticulous analysis uh, of source material, has been a guiding motif in Jewish studies ever since, for the last 200 years. Um, it was an important impulse in the work uh, of 20th century historians, and here it's important to note uh, the pioneering work in the field of Jewish women's history of Paula Hyman, uh, the late uh, Yale scholar, uh, who joined with 
uh, a number of other colleagues um, of her cohort uh, to attempt to read the women's experience back into Jewish history. And in that sense, to liberate Jewish historiography from its patriarchal uh, impulses and inclinations. Um, so liberation has been an important motif in modern Jewish scholarship and a way in which uh, modern Jewish historians have invested a substantial portion of their identity in the interpretation, the reading of the past. Um, another important uh, motif in modern Jewish historical scholarship for reasons that are not unobvious is consolation, consolation. Uh, many Jewish historians have felt that it is their task to console the readers of Jewish history, um, and in particular to assure them that they, who have been subjected to discrimination or persecution, were neither the first nor the last, but nonetheless, there was an ongoing link of Jewish continuity that was unbroken. Um, and this is, in fact, uh, one of the uh, operative principles in perhaps the most, the purest form of historical consolation um, in modern Jewish historical scholarship that I know, which is the book um, on your left, uh, a Hebrew, a three volume Hebrew um, uh, uh, compilation by the Galician born uh, scholar Shimon Bernfeld who believed that it was his task to assemble a large inventory of persecutions and sufferings that Jews had experienced precisely in order to show the vitality and the unbreakability of the bond of Jewish historical continuity. This was, to use the famous term of the great 20th century Jewish historian Salah Baron, a manifestly lachrymose approach to Jewish history a mournful or tearful approach, but it served the purpose of consolation to demonstrate that precisely uh, the, the fact that Jews were writing about this long inventory of, uh, of, of past uh, acts was an indication of the ongoing vi vitality of, uh, of Jewish history. Um, and this motif of consolation uh, has been particularly pronounced, was particularly pronounced in the historical writing, the really remarkable project of historical writing that took place during the Holocaust, not after the Holocaust. That's a subject for another day, but during the Holocaust. And here, um, I'm particularly thinking of the astonishing project assembled by, uh, convened, put together, and, and executed by the figure on, on your right, um, uh, a young Polish Jewish historian by the name of Emanuel Ringelblum who shortly after the German invasion of Poland in September 1st, 19, on September 1st, 1939, uh, and the subsequent ghettoization of Polish Jewry um, some number of months thereafter, began to convene, organize uh, a regular uh, group of professional historians, amateur chroniclers, observers of life within the ghetto, uh, the Warsaw Ghetto uh, that he uh, found himself in, um, the group would convene on Saturday afternoon, and hence it was known as, somewhat ironically, the Onig Shabbos, the, the delight or pleasure of the, of the Sabbath. Um, and they tried to capture every dimension of life within the ghetto, comparing it to what preceded uh, uh, the ghettoization of Polish Jewry. Uh, what life looked like before and what it looked like now within the ghetto, and what we know uh, about life within the ghetto, we know a great deal, owes to the heroic efforts of Ringelblum and his cohort. Um, we know of enormous cultural vitality in the face of persecution, suffering, and death. Um, Ringelblum felt it imperative to leave behind a record, both of the vitality and of the constantly constraining circumstances of the ghetto for future generations an historical record to chronicle that ongoing impulse to live that existed within uh, the Warsaw Ghetto, um, and thus offer a measure of consolation, imagine this, for future generations. 
as he and his uh, uh, contemporaries were undergoing uh, uh, devastating uh, persecution. So consolation, I would suggest, has been uh, an important motif in which the historian has invested a good part of his or her identity uh, as a Jew in order to sustain uh, an ongoing connection uh, of Jewish history and consciousness. Third motif that I'd like to look at briefly um, is this, um, the motif of witnessing. It really issues from the first two, um, but assumes central form in the 20th century. Um, it isn't simply that Jews chronicled uh, the persecution and suffering that their co-religionist underwent. They also began uh, in the 1920s to serve as witnesses. And I don't mean that in a religious sense, I mean that in an actual legal sense, uh, to call attention um, and testify about uh, the suffering of their co-religionists. Um, in this sense, one of the pioneers, perhaps the pioneer uh, of this um, particular function of Jewish historical scholarship that reflected a strong identitarian investment was uh, the testimony of the figure on the left, Elias Cherikover, at a very interesting trial uh, in 1927. Um, in 1926, um, a man by the name of Shalom Schwarzbad made his way to Paris, where he shot dead on the street the man he held responsible for the uh, brutal pogroms, anti-Jewish violence that broke out in Ukraine in 1919 that took the lives of dozens of his family members. Uh, Schwarzbad admitted openly to his guilt um, and uh, in part as a result of a very skilled lawyer and the testimony of the historian Elias Cherikover, who chronicled the extent of devastation and murder that Jews were subjected to in the Ukrainian pogroms, Schwarzbad was acquitted. Um, and this marks really one of the first instances in which we see a Jewish historian performing that role of witnessing. Perhaps, however, the most famous instance of a Jewish historian performing that role was um, uh, with the person in the middle whom I've already mentioned as the author of the famous expression, the lacrimose conception of Jewish history, and that is uh, Professor Salah Witt Wittmeyer Baron, who together with Heinrich Gretz, whom we will encounter in a minute, and Shimon Dubnov, whom we'll encounter in a moment, was one of the three great macro historians of Jewish history in uh, the modern era. Baron was the author of an 18 volume uh, history of the Jews, the social and religious history of the Jews, Dubnov, a 10-volume history of the Jews, and Gretz, uh, an 11-volume history of the Jews. These are the three towering figures uh, of what we might call a Jewish macro history. Baron, uh, who uh, was born as well in Galicia, educated in Vienna, came to the United States as a young man where he taught uh, first at the Jewish Institute of Religion, and then in 1930 became the first Jewish historian first scholar of Jewish history appointed to a chair in that field at a major American university, at Columbia University, 1930. Spent the entirety of his career in the United States. And in 1961, after Israeli special agents captured Adolf Eichmann uh, from uh, Buenos Aires, uh, Baron was called by um, the Israeli authorities, um, uh, particularly Prosecutor Gidon Hausner with uh, input, very considerable input from Prime Minister David Ben-Goyon to come to Jerusalem to serve as the expert historical witness in the Eichmann trial. Now, this was by um, many accounts, certainly the Israelis, um, an unsuccessful uh, uh, appointment. Um, Ben-Goyon uh, was not happy with, uh, with Baron's testimony. Uh, which went on for hours, um, in which Baron offered a painstaking account of the full range of Jewish cultural, economic, social, and political life in Europe prior to 
the ascent to power of Adolf Hitler. This was what he thought his task was. Um, and in doing so, what he tried to demonstrate was the enormity of the loss by depicting this extraordinary uh, cultural vitality that European Jewry uh, manifested. Um, it was, um, in many regards, um, an extraordinary sight to see a baron in this very stiff, formal Hebrew, largely operating without a note, recited over the course of five or seven hours uh, the entire history of uh, European Jewry from the early modern period, uh, covering uh, many dimensions of uh, Jewish life. Um, this was a rather remarkable instance of historical witnessing, um, and uh, Baron clearly invested a huge amount of time and a huge amount of his own sense of Jewish identity uh, in order to come and perform this act really of national service, as it were, to the Jewish people. Um, another instance of witnessing, more uh, recent in time, that nonetheless reflects the way in which historians uh, really invest themselves in the work of historical scholarship arose in the late 1990s when um, a Holocaust um, chronicler who happened to be um, a denier of, uh, of the full extent of Jewish suffering during uh, the uh, Second World War by the name of David Irving um, actually sued the American historian Deborah Lipstadt, uh, who he claimed had misrepresented her in uh, her book, Denial, in which she chronicled the phenomenon of Holocaust denial uh, in the late 20th century. Um, and as some of you may know, uh, this, uh, uh, this, this, um, the, the ensuing trial, uh, Irving v. Lipstadt, which took place in London, became a huge uh, cause celeb uh, throughout the scholarly uh, uh, and uh, popular world. Um, in England, according to uh, the laws of libel, it is the defendant who has to uh, prove the veracity of the statements uh, in question. And this was a very particular, a very um, challenging task, um, in part because Irving had written so much um, uh, uh, over uh, the course of his uh, half-century career. Um, Professor Lipstadt engaged um, a great English lawyer by the name of Anthony Julius, who went about uh, his work by assembling what has been called the dream team of historians. Um, who ended up writing thousands of pages of refutation of uh, David Irving, and a number of them took the stand, uh, the most important of which were, is the, uh, the English historian of the Third Reich uh, and uh, modern Germany, Richard Evans. Um, and it's interesting that in his reflections uh, on the trial, a book emerged he, uh, from his hand out of his work as an expert witness in the Irving v. Lipstadt trial, um, Evans said that he was fighting for the defense of history. Um, and uh, in a certain sense, consistent with his general historiographical perspective, denied that there was an excessive investment of self in this work. By contrast, Deborah Lipstadt says that she understood that what was at stake uh, in the Irving v. Lipstadt trial was the memory of the Holocaust for future generations. Um, the memory of the Holocaust. So in a certain sense, Evans was focused on the particular details, and Lipstadt was focused on really uh, the lingering memory uh, uh, for future generations, especially at this uh, extraordinarily important and tremulous point in time when uh, the survivor generation is passing from the world. Uh, there's an added sense of urgency to set in place a memory that cannot be altered uh, so easily uh, by the work of deniers like uh, David Irving. Um, and so this brings us uh, to, um, I suppose, the heart of the matter, which is uh, having been exposed to various guiding motifs in the study of Jewish history, why should we continue to do it today? Well, I would suggest to you that there is the entertainment value. Um, many of us just love to read history uh, because it's, it satisfies our curiosity about how other cultures and peoples lived. 
In addition, there is, of course, the archaeological function of history, that impulse that was present um, in uh, historians past who sought to uncover uh, objects and data and actors who had been uh, forgotten uh, from history. Uh, so there's, there's a kind of archaeological function that uh, we should appreciate in history as part of our quest to understand more fully uh, the world and how we came about. Um, there is also, I would say, an important preservative function to history, a preservative function to history. Um, history serves not only to uncover texts from the past or actors from the past, but to preserve it. Um, as uh, an ongoing legacy, um, as an ongoing focal point of identity. Um, and I would say a subset of the preservative impulse is a kind of ethical imperative uh, that comes with preserving. And here I think of uh, the work of the great uh, philosopher Edith Wishograd in her important book called An Ethics of Remembering, in which she said, there is an ethical imperative to remember especially the voices of those who were extinguished without an opportunity to be heard. Especially, she thought and wrote, those who suffered and died in the Holocaust. The historian has an ethical imperative to bring to life those voices. This is an act of, a basic act of humanity to recall and recover those voices. Um, in addition, calling to attention those voices serves as a cautionary note against certain tendencies uh, that uh, were present in the past that may uh, uh, recur in, in the present. So there's an added element to that ethical imperative uh, that, uh, that Wishograd pointed to. Um, I would suggest that another function of history is the deconstructive function, the deconstructive fun function. Um, by which I mean deconstructing or challenging dangerous myths uh, or prejudices. Um, there is uh, a great deal of bad history that is written every day. And some portion of it is quite pernicious. It perpetuates lies and stereotypes and distortions from the past. And so one function for good history is to deconstruct. And I think of this very much Something disappeared down this lectern. I have no idea what it is. Uh, it's not my watch, and it's not, it's not this water. So that's good. Um, I think of this uh, very much in these weeks because of what has been transpiring in Poland. And here, I think we can begin to see a sense of the urgency of history. And I mean the urgency of good history. Um, uh, as some of you may know, um, in early February, uh, the Polish parliament passed a law that criminalized uh, those who claimed that the Polish nation or Polish state was responsible for Nazi crimes. Um, in fact, uh, as you see in the, in the statute uh, that was passed, um, uh, this, uh, this, this, this statute called for either a fine or actual imprisonment uh, for the sin of uh, suggesting that Poles may have been involved in uh, the murder of Jews. And to a great extent, um, this law, which I'm happy to say that for the moment, um, the Polish Attorney General has suggested might be unconstitutional, so there is hope uh, that this will not, in fact, uh, go into force. Uh, to a certain extent, this law um, it certainly belongs to the zeitgeist in Poland, the spirit of the time, when we have a right-wing government in power very much intent on producing a sanitized view of the past. Um, Post-communist Poland has seen moments of extraordinary openness, uh, during which, I should say, Jewish life has uh, flourished, um, and moments of reaction. Um, and one of the places in which uh, this pendulous swing can be seen is the National Historical Institute of Poland, which has moved between periods of greater and lesser openness towards the past. We now are in a period of uh, constrained 
uh, uh, approaches to the past, very much focused on uh, producing this kind of sanitized view of Polish behavior. The, the claim is not Poles as a whole are guilty for the murder of Jews. Rather, some Poles are. And this is uh, the uh, assertion made by a prominent Polish American uh, historian and sociologist of Jewish origin by the name of Jan T. Gross, pictured um, to your left, who in the year 2000 wrote a book called Neighbors, in which he talked about how uh, in the town of Jedwabne, Poland, a substantial portion of the Catholic population of the town, which had coexisted with the Jewish population for decades and even centuries, turned against it in a murderous rage and killed um, much of the Jewish population of the town. It's interesting to note that in the wake of neighbors, in one of those moments of liberal openness, Jan Gross was awarded a medal, and the president of Poland went to Jedwabne to express his acknowledgment of responsibility for guilt on behalf of the Polish people towards the murdered Jewish population of Jedwabne. We live in a different time, needless to say. The Polish president is a different president. Um, in fact, the Polish president is the president who called for an investigation to have the medal that Jan Gross received uh, taken away from him. And this reminds us that history is both a function of its time and inescapably political, a very much a, a product of, uh, of the politics of the day. But that doesn't mean, I think, that all history is equally political, equally ideological, equally subjective. Part of the burden of what I've suggested to you is that there is an inescapably subjective dimension to historical analysis. That seems beyond dispute. But there also are the consensual norms of the profession of history that value and, in fact, place a premium on careful, meticulous sifting of uh, data and sources such that we can distinguish between good work and less good work. Uh, the goal, um, Collingwood tells us, is not to arrive at absolute truth, but rather at relative truth, relative truth, mindful of uh, the, uh, the, the uh, presence of environmental, emotional, um, unmistakably ideological, identitarian uh, factors, uh, which we try uh, to minimize, um, but at the same time acknowledge that sometimes uh, new pathways of understanding are opened by them. And this really, I think, reflects the ideal balance that an historian should strike, um, uh, a balance that the late 19th century uh, German philosopher Wilhelm Dilthey was quite aware of, which is uh, the balance between uh, a position of critical distance on one hand and empathy for one's uh, historical objects on the other. All right, I want to move ahead to another function of history in our time that I think reflects um, an important way in which we should understand the past, um, and that is the constructive function for history. We looked at the deconstructive, but I want to focus on the constructive function. And just uh, briefly, to make our way through the 19th century, history was called upon uh, to play a constructive role in forging the boundaries of Jewish religious denominations um, in the 19th century. Um, each of the denominational strands that emerged in Germany in the 19th century had, is, had its own historians um, who um, used the past to make clear how we got to a reform, orthodox, or uh, what was known as positive historical or conservative perspective. And here are three of the leading figures of 19th century Jewish historical scholarship who sought to construct uh, a, a, a positive connection between past and present as they forge the boundaries of denominations, uh, beginning with the reformer Abraham Geiger, uh, the great macro historian Heinrich Gretz, and on uh, the orthodox side of the spectrum, the founder of a modern rabbinical seminary in Berlin by the name of Israel Hildesheimer. This constructive function, whereby the historian seeks to construct a meaningful connection between past and present, not to deconstruct, but to construct, uh, was also a guiding motif in 
uh, the great era of Jewish nationalist historiography in the, uh, in the first half of the 20th century. Um, and here, just briefly, I'd mention uh, the great advocate of Jewish cultural autonomy in the diaspora, uh, and in that regard, the great uh, conversation partner and foil of the cultural Zionist Achad Am, uh, Simon or Shimon Dubnov, author of a 10-volume history of the Jews, uh, perhaps the classic Zionist historian, uh, ben Sion Dinur, um, who argued that throughout Jewish history there was a kind of hypnotic allure of the land of Israel uh, to, uh, uh, to Jews. And we should also mention the Marxist Zionist historian, Raphael Mahler, um, who offered his own unique perspective. But here we see attempts to construct a meaningful, positive link between past and present. And I think that construct, constructive function can also be seen in the historical writings of uh, more recent historians, including Paula Hyman, whom I mentioned in her book, Gender and Assimilation in Modern Jewish History, um, and in the work of the uh, prolific scholar of Talmud rabbinic literature, Daniel Boyarin, um, who ventured into early modern and modern times uh, with a book called Unheroic Conduct that sought to bring to the fore, in that kind of liberating function that we, call, we made reference to earlier, um, uh, a kind of homoerotic and even homosexual um, identity um, uh, on the part of particularly Jewish men um, in Eastern Europe uh, through Western and Central Europe uh, from the uh, 18th through the early 20th centuries. Um, again, I think both of these historians used uh, their study of the past in order to construct a meaningful link between past and present as a way of forging a positive identity for uh, groups with which they themselves identified. Um, just a brief reminder that that kind of insertion of identity um, runs against a certain grain of uh, recent thought, uh, which I would associate with the uh, political philosopher Mark Lilla, who I think was on November 18th last year, um, uh, 10 days after the election of Donald Trump as president, uh, no, uh, 10 days in a year after the election, is that right, uh, of Donald Trump sought to uh, make sense of what had happened in America um, and uh, suggested that uh, the excess of multicultural identities had exploded any meaningful notion of what uh, it meant to be an American um, and argued for a kind of re- uh, centering of uh, American identity by uh, uh, discarding all those uh, um, discrete uh, cultural identities. Um, I'm not sure that that vision of a kind of literally blanched uh, American, and I mean that in a literal uh, sense, uh, uh, liberal identity is possible or even desirable. So we can talk about that perhaps further. Um, but. Um, what this suggests to us is that um, identity can serve, I guess what I would like to promote, uh, pr propose is that identity can serve to fortify uh, uh, a sense of uh, group memory that in and of itself is, uh, uh, can be very much uh, a positive uh, feature in, 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 uh, as, a, as a repository of uh, uh, of the individual, the expressions of individuals. That is to say, uh, forging a group memory can in fact impart, as, as uh, historians have noted, a sense of meaning uh, uh, in, in our past uh, and present. Um, and I mentioned the connection between identity and group memory because it brings me to the last part of, of my presentation, which is the reflection on the work of my teacher, whom I referred to earlier, Professor Yosef Chaim Yushalmi. Um, who positive in the book we see uh, here on the right, a very stark uh, chasm or gap between history and memory. So memory is what pre-modern Jewish chroniclers uh, attempted to foster. Memory is what rituals like the Passover Seder sought to foster. History is what modern university trained historians um, uh, attempted to write in their work. Um, and Yushalmi suggested that really there was a very wide gap between the two, at least in Zachor. Um, I wrote a book 
out there called The Stakes of History, in which I suggest two things. One, um, I believe that the gap between history and memory uh, is much narrower than Professor Yushalmi suggested, that in fact, modern Jewish historians have very frequently sought to foster and promote a strong form of group memory, um, like the figures whom we just looked at. But that Yushalmi himself, in other writings, was attuned to this, um, and that Zachor was the product of a particular moment of uh, despair uh, in his career. Um, in fact, he surely was mindful of the fact that his own teacher, Sela Baron, the witness at the uh, Eichmann trial, was seeking to set in place a certain memory uh, when he testified uh, at the trial. Um, what was that memory? That memory was a recollection of the power of Jewish cultural vitality that had been uh, so grievously threatened by the, uh, by the uh, German Nazi-led extermination campaign. Um, in that sense, um, Baron was keeping alive that impulse to uncover the sources of vitality, the anti lacrimose uh, sources of Jewish history. Um, and uh, he was, in that sense, very closely connected to another uh, great historian of uh, the 20th century who also taught at Columbia and then became the chancellor of the Jewish Theological Seminary, uh, Professor Gerson Cohn, who also focused on the constant uh, cultural dynamism of Jewish history as uh, uh, a way of understanding the survival of the Jews. So I would suggest that um, even in uh, Yushalmi's earlier and later work, there was an appreciation uh, for the role of the historian in setting in place a memory uh, for uh, uh, future generations. And even if one uh, uh, denies that possibility in a reading of Yushalmi's work, I believe that this is in fact what uh, Jewish historians have done. I want to conclude by looking at one final function uh, for history. And that is um, actually one and a half. Um, that is the conciliatory or problem-solving function of history. We see in a number of uh, conf conflict-ridden or post-conflict uh, situations around the world a call to history and the historian to play a role. Um, as if working through the past is an important part of moving to a new level of understanding between warring partners. This is often at work in uh, the operation of truth and reconciliation uh, commissions, TRCs. Um, and we have seen the way in which history has been employed as a tool of conciliation between uh, Protestants and Catholics in Northern Ireland, as well as um, amongst the, warring, the former, formerly warring factions in uh, what was once Yugoslavia. Um, I can't report to you that the success of history has been absolute, that uh, history has managed to reconcile all differences between the groups. But nonetheless, it is important to note that various people involved in reconciliation efforts have recognized that without both coming to terms with the past and recognizing the historical narrative of the other, uh, there may be little hope for a long-term uh, harmonious relationships. And I mention this, of course, uh, as a Jewish historian, as someone who has um, thought and written a lot about uh, uh, the Middle East, uh, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, um, where one asks oneself, uh, is there a need to indeed engage history, in part to address historical grievances, or is there a need to transcend history? And I understand both positions. My own view as an historian is that uh, without engaging uh, the historical wounds and traumas of the two sides, um, harmonious coexistence will be even more unlikely. And it seems pretty unlikely at this moment. So, so we, we're not in a period in which we're ready yet for historical reconciliation. But you know, there have been periods, and one in particular during the 1990s, when some Israelis and Palestinians actually got together and said, let's take a look at the way in which we represent the other's history. In fact, let's take a look at the way in which textbooks represent the other's history. And they got together and they produced a number of works, uh, both at the level of uh, elementary and secondary school curricula and at the level of a university-based reader uh, 
uh, like what you see uh, on the screen here. Um, this volume is called Side by Side, which doesn't attempt to reconcile two narratives. It simply presents two narratives side by side, Palestinian narrative and Israeli narrative, with the assumption that mere exposure to the narrative of the other can have a humanizing uh, uh, impact. Um, this curriculum or this curricular approach, it's, it's important to note, has not been um, accepted by either Ministry of Education, um, but uh, the work of this cohort of scholars really continues to the present. There's another way in which history might play a role. Um, history is a huge repository of discarded ideas. Now, we stand at a moment when it looks like the preferred diplomatic solution of the last uh, 20 years or so, the two-state solution, is gravely endangered. I say that as someone who is himself uh, an advocate of the two-state solution. If that be the case, um, can we look back to the past to find new ideas? There are many on the left and the right, on both sides, Palestinian and Israeli, that are now calling for a single state. Um, in the past, we have seen all sorts of other ideas emerge to the fore um, or be proposed over time, like a confederation of a Palestinian entity with an existing uh, Arab state. Um, some have proposed a Canton system, as you see here on the map uh, on the right. And some have suggested uh, a regional alliance. Um, in fact, this was the idea of David Ben-Gurion when he met with uh, the Palestinian um, lawyer, Musa Alami, um, and thought that maybe a Jewish state could join together with a larger uh, Arab political alliance, unlikely uh, as that has seemed over time. Um, finally, um, I want to call attention to the predictive function of history. Um, and this is an idea that um, has been played with by a number of figures, including the great uh, Austrian, Jewish, British historian Eric Hobsbawm, and more recently, in 2013, uh, by two uh, historians, Joe Gouldy uh, of Southern Methodist University and David Armitage of Harvard, um, in their history manifesto, in which they yearned for a return to what they called long-termism in history, a long-term perspective that allowed us to understand major trends. They said that now with the advent of big data, we have the capacity to understand long-term trends uh, in history. These are some of the reasons why I think history is of value to us. And I sometimes, I must confess, um, uh, have doubt. And I think of some of these uh, uses for history, just to um, uh, reprise what I've sought to impart, uh, fortifying a link to the past, the deconstructive function, uh, that conciliatory function. Um, history, I should add, um, in closing, can be of relevance, of real particular relevance in understanding uh, current predicaments, and Jewish history in particular. Um, Jewish history offers a template for how immigrant groups struggle in and adapt to majority societies. And perhaps even more importantly in our time, Jewish history offers up a kind of early warning system for threats to the democratic tradition. Uh, because it is very often uh, marginal immigrant groups and Jews who are subjected to uh, prejudice and discrimination in word before that uh, is translated to deed. I must confess um, in conclusion, and this is really my last uh, slide, that I have doubts, uh, having just spent an hour trying to argue the contrary, and when I have doubts, I remember uh, the words attributed to uh, the great Shimon Dubnov, uh, who um, moved back in 1933 to Riga, Latvia from Berlin uh, in order to try to implement uh, in Eastern Europe his ideal of a autonomous cultural entity in which Jews could thrive and live a full Jewish life under the sovereign control uh, of uh, another country. Uh, that ideal was never realized. And um, Dubnov's decision to return to Eastern Europe in 1933 was really ill-fated. Uh, 
1941, fall of 1941, uh, German troops and Nazi uh, uh, units entered into Riga uh, and rounded up and executed uh, different groups of Jews in October, and then rounded up a group that included Dubnov on December 8th, 1941. Uh, it is said that as Dubnov uh, made his way to his own death, he shouted out to those who survived, Jews, write and record. And that for me is really the guiding uh, ethos of the historian and the Jewish historian in the modern age. Thank you very much. What a lot of ground was covered in short space of time. How extraordinarily impressive. Um, I will give us 10 minutes for question and answer and then um, more time a little bit afterwards when people can uh, you know, help themselves to food and, and if you wish, buy books. Uh, yeah. I, I'd like to pick up on your um, point about problem solving and, and kind of using history to apply it. I, I just read the book by Graham Allison about destined for war, China and, and the US, and he talks in there, I learned for the first time about his idea or uh, idea that he's developed that there should be a council Historical of historical advisors, not just a council of economic advisors. And I'm wondering if you see, I mean, it doesn't sound like you're that optimistic, but I'm just wondering if you could comment on that and picking up on your point about Israel and Palestine, is there hope that, that there could be some serious listening that not just side by side narratives, but some, some common understandings that, that right. historians could really help us? Thank you. Um, you're right. So, um, it was about a year ago that Graham Allison and his former colleague at, um, at Harvard, Neil Ferguson, uh, proposed in an article in The Atlantic the idea uh, that alongside the Council of Economic Advisors, there should be a Council of Historical Advisors. Um, and um, I must say, um, I think that's an absolutely splendid idea. Um, more than that, I think every branch of government uh, should have its own embedded historians, and I should add, many do. There are some 3,000 historians working in uh, the United States, the federal government, um, who do really ex exceptional work. Um, what I would like to see, and at UCLA we've just inaugurated a new Center for History and Policy, is um, a much more regular encounter between thought leaders, policymakers, and politicians on one hand, and historians on the other. Um, it seems to me that the contextual logic of the historian, let me understand a phenomenon in a particular uh, setting, is really the basis for problem solving. Right? That's how you understand how a problem came about. You dismantle it, you expose the different parts to uh, the light of day, and then you try and piece it together and understand what a potential path uh, out of the problem is. So I. Uh, it's completely self-serving to say, but I believe deeply in the contextual logic of the, of the historian and believe that, uh, that policymakers and politicians would benefit enormously from understanding the history of the problem. Now, we and this, at this UCLA Center understand that politicians are not likely to make time out of their busy schedules, but their staffers are. Um, and so that's a very key uh, target area to really make our way with this message of the importance of history, not as uh, the panacea for all ills, but as an ex essential leavening agent in the formation of policy. Should that rise to the level of a federal council of historical advisors, that would be wonderful. Uh, meanwhile, the rest of us have to begin from the local level and talk to our local politicians and policymakers about the importance of history. I suppose that's my response to your second uh, question, Bob, about uh, Israel-Palestine. I mean, there doesn't seem, I don't see um, either side uh, at the level of official government representative saying what we really need to solve this problem is a bunch of historians in the room. Uh, that I haven't heard. Um, but like so much of that problem, I believe that if and when a solution is ever achieved, it will come from the bottom up. 
it will come from the bottom up. And here too, um, you know, I think we should not dismiss the work of these noble historians on both sides, uh, two of whom I'll mention, Professor Eyal Nave at Tel Aviv University uh, and Professor Sami Adwan, uh, formerly of Bethlehem, now at Nablus University, who have you know, defied skeptics uh, within their own camp for decades to continue with this work, um, waiting for the day when a minister of education will say, I think that's important. I think it's important to, in a certain sense, step out of our own narrative to see the lived historical experience of the other. Um, and we should hope. Thank you, very interesting. I wanted to ask you, how do we trust history and historians? Um, you know, we can talk about, you know, our own American history here and, you know, some things we, we, we don't wish to talk about, statues are disappearing and uh, the command, Ten Commandments are, are, are pulled out of, uh, of the courthouses. Um, you know, in the UN, we could talk about uh, Israel and kind of look at, you know, uh, what they're saying, you know, what one side is saying about uh, right. uh, the Israeli soldiers as, as uh, baby killers and all these things. Does that become history? And does that become something of, of you know, which will last forever as controversy? And how do you determine what truth is? Because we've all read in textbooks growing up, one liberal, you know, one point of view or another point of view and not necessarily history. And then as we get older, we, we, we start to read, uh, kind of uh, get more uh, truth or, or so we think. And so the question is like, what is the truth about, uh, of history? Yeah, well, I mean, that is the question, Ronnie, that you, you've sort of put your finger on the most challenging question, especially when I've acknowledged and even called for the investment of the scholar's identity in uh, the work at hand. Like, doesn't that just muddy the waters, um, you know, beyond recognition so that it's all just one subjective pond? Um, and I think that's a legitimate question. That's, it's understandable why many other historians would say we must try to achieve the highest degree of objectivity and filter out any uh, extraneous uh, uh, factors in our framing of, uh, of the past, including our own individual bias and, and, and identity commitments. Uh, I just think it's, as I said, impossible to do so, and, and there's, there's virtue um, in introducing uh, within reason uh, some of these factors into uh, the cast that we use to make sense of the past. But we have to recognize that while certain events, I believe, occurred as an actual matter of truth, as an ontological matter, our understanding of them invariably changes depending on our time and place. Um, and we have to recognize that in that sense, history is always changing, hence, what once was an accepted celebration of a revered figure in another generation um, is uh, an instance of a statue that should be taken down. Um, and so I would say what we have at hand, and this is the best answer I can give you, is the, sh is the consensual norms of the profession of history about what constitutes good history, mindful of the fact that they shift over time. Mindful of the fact that each generation articulates the ideal of challenging and overturning the interpretation of the preceding generation, right? So that's, you know, to say there's a single unchanging standard of objective historical truth, I think, defies all credulity. To acknowledge that each generation tries to do the best it can to get it right, to achieve what Collingwood called relative truth, I think that's, that's what we can aspire to. That's what we can... And, and really rely on you know, the, the consensus, uh, as, as imperfect as it is, the consensus of the historical community. So for example, the consensus of the historical community overwhelmingly is that the Holocaust took place. There's a small radical fringe that says no. Um, and they have been you know, uh, really um, uh, regarded as beyond the pale of legitimacy by that consensual norm. So I think that's about the best we can hope for. Uh, but it also you know, can rely on extremely, that consensual norm, extremely meticulous, careful 
sifting of data, exhaustive historical work uh, that, uh, that persuades one by, uh, by the power of the evidence uh, marshaled. Uh, I just want to, first of all, thank you for that very uh, eloquent defense of, of the importance of history and Jewish history. I'm wondering whether uh, you might speak to some of the threats that uh, those functions, and particularly in light of your own experience uh, over the past year or two, and the, 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 what, it, what are the conditions necessary uh, within the academy and in society at large, and including within the Jewish community, to sustain those functions? the value of history? What are the kind of threats that you see? I think maybe you might have to explicate the question a little bit. Yeah. The illusion. Okay. So, so um, uh, without rendering this too personal, um, uh, so I assumed a new position uh, in New York in, uh, in the late summer. Um, and uh, when I assumed the position as president of the Center for Jewish History, which is a really um, important institution devoted to the study of the Jewish past, um, some folks thought that I should be uh, removed from that position shortly thereafter um, because I belong to um, certain Jewish organizations and had uh, long uh, written record on uh, the left side of the political spectrum. Um, I would say, you know, to be very candid, there's a malady in our midst. Um, there's an intolerance for dissenting views. Um, and in my case, the intolerance came unquestionably from the right and it's a plague. I will say um, that you know, I, I, I don't think that the other side of the political spectrum is, uh, is completely immune from uh, uh, its own um, uh, maladies. Um, at one level, conditions have never been better, material and otherwise. Uh, uh, access to evidence. Uh, conditions have never been better to, uh, to write history. Uh, at another level, I think there are serious threats to the principle of open and free discourse, to uh, the legitim legitimacy of challenging uh, uh, established norms, uh, which the university is the prime place to engage in that precise task. Um, ironically enough, uh, the Jewish community has been a huge supporter of the American University, notwithstanding the American University's own checkered record with respect to the admission of Jews. Um, and yet, I think we're, we're in a time of, uh, you know, it's a kind of dialectical relationship between expanded opportunity uh, to explore new perspectives and a certain impulse to constrict or constrain the boundaries uh, of the permissible. It's evident in communal politics, it's evident in the political culture of this country, and it's also making its way to the university. And I think we want to be keenly aware of the danger at hand uh, because it really risks uh, destroying what is one of uh, this country's greatest achievements, which is its system of higher education, which has produced uh, research innovations um, of staggering significance. Hi, thanks for your lecture. I wonder if you could say something about the connection between history and social movements and historians and social change. I think it's certainly related to the identitarian project, but one thing I was thinking of when you were talking is um, when I think about the women's movement, for example, and the social movements of the 60s and 70s, it seems to me no accident that uh, many activists became historians, women's historians, for example, 
and that many people who were thinking about social change turned to history. That's the first thing that they did. So it seems that's an extension of policy as a function of historians and also of identity. Absolutely. So, Absolutely. But you know, I have... It could have been an, another asterisk, right? I have, I have conversations with colleagues of mine uh, at UCLA about what constitutes policy, right? There's policy from on high, policy from the top down, and there's policy from the bottom up. And what they have in mind is the kind of policy that is formed by alliances between social movements, labor unions, uh, and political organizations that sort of help to shape the way we understand and frame society. So I think you're absolutely right to call attention to that. I happen to be reading right now a really wonderful essay by the historian Tema Kaplan uh, about how inextricable her uh, commitments as an historian and social activist are and were, how formative these two were in shaping her as a person. And same with Gerda Lerner and Paula Hyman. And Gerda Lerner, completely, and Paul for that matter. I happen to be reading Tema's, uh, you know, exact reference to what you've just described, which is really for her the inseparability. And it's interesting to note because I often say, you know, as, as, as chair of a large and often unruly department, I used to say, you know, historians are an overwhelmingly progressive lot, progressive to radical lot. But when it comes to department politics, they're the most change averse group I've ever seen. <laughs> they study change, but they are not advocates of change. Um, and yet, it is true that historians have been, especially in the 1960s, were so prominently represented uh, in social movements, um, not merely to chronicle, uh, chronicle them, but to draw upon their historical learning um, to reach back to the past for uh, examples and, of inspiration. Um, we happen to be having at the Center for Jewish History, sorry for plugging uh, another program, tomorrow night, the sociologist uh, Todd Gitlin, who was uh, one of the major figures of uh, Students for Democratic Society uh, in the late 60s, he's going to be reflecting uh, on a 50-year perspective on uh, uh, social activism from 1968 to the present. And one question that I was thinking of as I was coming up here uh, today was, what does history tell us, or Jewish history for that matter, about this rather remarkable youth-led movement that um, manifested itself with such force on Saturday. Um, what, what linkages can we see? What, to what extent is that youth-led movement drawing on the past? Or is it explicitly not because it's a youth-led movement? Um, what does history teach us about movements led by youth? Um, so I think these are all really important questions that uh, affirm the importance of that link that you've drawn. Thank you. That may be the messianic bridge and the little child that leads us. Um, before I release you to more informal conversation and urge the students to eat all the food that's here, um, I'm wondering if, if there is a student who might want to ask a last question. Macarena. History student, senior. Um, and I wanted to ask you about the whole notion of imagined history. So I'm thinking concretely about groups in exile, groups that have gone through a trauma, and how there's a tendency to privilege certain events in history. Um, so for example, in Rwanda, this notion that before colonialism, people lived in peace. Um, in Mexico, where I'm from, this idea that in the time before the conquest, we had these fantastic empires who were not only prolific in science and culture, but had wonderful, peaceful societies. And this whole idea that we have of imagining history as always much better or much nicer than the present, and how that exists in contrast with moments of exception such as the Holocaust, or in the case of um, Passover celebration, the, exile, the exodus from Egypt. Wow, fantastic question. Um, She's typical. I, amazing. Um, it's, a, it's a danger that lurks, I think, in the heart of what I've called the constructive function for history which is very much committed to forging a kind of positive identity out of an often romanticized past. Um, it's a common feature in nationalist historiography, historiography yoked to nationalism. Um, 
uh, where we see two prominent impulses. One, um, the claim that the nation uh, was essentially eternal and certainly had its roots in antiquity, um, when in fact other scholars have suggested um, the nation as it manifests itself in the 19th century was a rather recent formation. And two, that the nation was the embodiment of unsurpassed virtue, right? So there is that, uh, that uh, romanticizing impulse that is very much associated with the constructive function of history that we have to uh, be mindful of. Um, for me, the, the, the challenge is to, um, to acknowledge that while not dismissing the importance of the empowering dimensions of history to bring to the fore um, an identity from the past that has been suppressed. There often is a kind of romanticized impulse in that too, but nonetheless there is real value in adding to that, uh, that um, uh, extraordinary palette of colors that uh, history represents in its fullest, or at least the fullest to which we can humanly achieve. So that's, that's a real tension. Uh, that uh, you know, we, we have to be mindful of. Um, on one hand, excavating and giving voice to that which is lost, which often is enveloped in a certain romantic uh, packaging, and sort of the unrestrained uh, celebration uh, of one's own virtue without a shred uh, of self-criticism. I guess you know, the only thing I could say is, um, and I think this is a great Jewish teaching, um, but not exclusively Jewish teaching, and Jews often forget it. Um, the saving grace is self-criticism. Without that uh, enduring capacity to engage in a process that Jews call around the high holiday, high holiday times, cheshbon and nefesh, without that kind of accounting of the soul, there's no hope for us. And so um, while I'm mindful of the liberating power of history to retrieve the lost, we also have to accompany that impulse with a healthy dose of self-criticism. So thank you. I want to appreciate um, the impassioned plea for studying the past. I think the case is really very eloquently and eloquently made. And again, before releasing you, um, a couple of commercials. And um, I want to first put on my hat as director of the Humanities Center. Our theme this year for our own residential fellows and visiting uh, scholar is whose story. And in David Meyer's um, opening slide, he offered us uh, the recently deceased Hayden White, who's, who made the point that um, uh, that all history is shaped into a story, that it is historians who decide what the beginning, the middle, and the end is, who the heroes and the villains are, whether it is tragedy or comedy. And um, what I often say in my Jewish religion and culture class to students, um, and this comes partly from my um, attachment to Judaism from a feminist perspective, is that what we see of the past has everything to do with um, who's, who's holding the lantern and the direction in which the light is cast. So this is an ongoing um, process. I tell you all this because the culminating event for the Humanities Center uh, Fellowship is exactly one week from tonight, in exactly this time and place, when MacArthur Fellow Lewis Hyde will be offering a really countertext, I think, a complimentary countertext to your lecture called Forgetting Story, um, <laughs> where he is making the, he will make a kind of argument, an imaginative argument in his style that sometimes for truth and reconciliation to work, some time for peace to happen, part of the task is to decide what we remember and what we need to forget. Um, Lewis is a really brilliant speaker, and since I have a captive audience here, I do want to urge you to come. Um, and that's, again, one week from today, in exactly this time and place, on Forgetting Story, Professor Lewis Hyde. And finally, 
the week of April 10th is the annual um, Holocaust Awareness Week, uh, a week of um, commemorative occasions, lectures and learning that Northeastern has been engaging in for many decades. And our theme this year, of course, is timely. Uh, Professor Dove Waxman chairs the um, Holocaust Awareness Committee. And the theme is Nazism and Fascism Then and Now. There are, uh, there are flyers out there so you can acquaint yourself with the variety of events for that week. But since we are those, I'm making the assumption that if you're here, you care something about history, I want to draw particular attention to the Morton Lecture on Nazism and Fascism Then and Now, which will be a conversation moderated by our own Dean Uta Poiger um, between Ruth ben Gihat, Professor of History and Italian at NYU, and Jeff Ellie, I'm not sure I'm pronouncing that right, um, who is a distinguished university professor of contemporary history at the University of Michigan. So we can extend this conversation. And for me, I mean, this is, a, this is, as you said, history's moment. I think we need to be engaging in continual conversation, in self-criticism, in analysis, and um, to take advantage of the extraordinary riches and privileges of being at a university where we can engage in civilized conversation with one another about matters of urgent concern, um, especially when, for I, at least I'm speaking for myself, uh, one feels the fragility of um, the fragility of all things, including some things that we for, take for granted as stable and forever. So um, thank you for your contribution to this conversation, for traveling from the West Coast, and for being here tonight. Thank you to David Myers, and thank you, of course, to the Ruderman Family Foundation and the Ruderman family. Thank you.